Onalani ya di Tugulu. Tugulu. Ine le pofolo e ne sinale naga. Ine le pofolo ya shlo e kholo. Lungwe te lili. Kaobane pu Tugulu ne pila le pofolo te sa. Te swana le bota u. Le bo le ngaw. Busi u. Ine dula e tu hile ka mesa. E taba pofolo te na te di. Kya e nga kato ya oge e talo kopa. Ntwa wi tirele za honda de mudimu. Kya e kopa honda de mudimu. I find to eat a little. I want that they would move away from the naga. Kika ho, you get to the old to grill in your tola, the naga lay on a gate. This is a farm in the northwest province of South Africa, home to a rhino family of three. Jabal, that's not his real name, takes care of the three rhinos. It's his duty to guard them day and night. He developed a special bond with his three friends. Jabal knows their habits and the peculiar traits of each one. Yeah, sometimes I get close, especially when I can see them first, you see. It's much easier for me to get close because they don't, have, they don't see me. I, it's just me who have to see them first, you see. But sometimes I get close at about 5 meters or 10 meters, especially in the winter time when you have to feed them, all those things, you see. Jabu fears that the three under his care will suffer the same fate as the 130 rhinos that have been slaughtered for their horns over the past year and a half in the northwest province. These figures are the same in Guazula Natal, Lampopo and the Kruger National Park. Rhino poaching has gradually worsened since 2009 and in spite of the public outcry the situation seems dire. One begs to ask the question as to why the number of poached rhinos is still rising even with all the public attention. Because some of these particular poachers use helicopters. They fly over Kruger or fly over any other park and are able to identify from, from, from that aerial view where the animals might be. And, and you know, there's been cases of uh, you know, you know, marksmen shooting from the, from the helicopters or jumping down, down, darting the rhino, chopping the horn within a few, flip, a few seconds. The, the helicopter is gone. So this is the level of poaching that you're dealing with. A whole new uh, proactive strategy had to be brought about insofar as anti-poaching unit staff um, had to be better trained, better focused in terms of rhino protection. We had to look at a, at a much more sophisticated level of um, reaction. So in the Kruger National Park you need to actually increase the fight, take, take that war, and it is a war, to the poachers. At the moment, it appears that the poachers still have the upper hand. The Defence Force largely is uh, in line with their mandate is to the border patrol between the Kruger and the neighbouring countries. The, the rangers we have in the park are for management and for protection of, 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 the, of the animals. Having NAT joints in place, which is South African National Parks, um, South African National Defence Force and South African Police working together, of course that increases the fight, but they still need uh, um, more equipment, uh, ranger training is of paramount importance. In ranger training you, ne you need to have rangers that are absolutely committed and whilst many many are, and I, I have evidence of that, I mean amazingly committed rangers in the Kruger National Park, you, we have to also face the reality that most, a lot of people just want jobs and being a ranger is a job. Go, Papa! It's a dangerous job. There are lions out there, there are elephants, there are buffalo, there are poachers that are armed, that are drugged, that are using medicine, that are aggressive. That is just the immediate threat. There's a malaria mosquito, then there is the heat, there's the cold, there's rain. Okay, then there's a physical part, there's the walking, 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 sleeping on the ground. So it's, it's hard work. It has been done in the past, it can be done again. 
to do it effectively, you need strong leadership. The South African Defence Force is vast. There are thousands and thousands of people that could be deployed along that eastern boundary. If there were OPs, and a lot of people say this is impractical, I don't believe that. There's enough public will to have that entire border with observation posts from south to north. That, in my view, would make a huge difference. At the moment, the committed Kruger Rangers, Section Rangers, Regional Rangers are really, really taking this war as best they can, but largely around an undefended boundary. What they call a rhino war has got two objectives. Political objective, security objective. Okay, our security objective is the Rangers. We must buy time for the rhino. So our objective is to keep the number of rhinos that are being poached at an acceptable level. While the politicians are battling to try and get the price down and the demand down. Okay. The politicians are as much part of this problem as the conservation organizations. Most of the parks are forced to, to rely on their own income, to generate their own income for survival. That's wrong. A rhino and these, this, these parks, national parks, are national assets, belongs to the country. So the government must come out of the corner and put money in, especially for security, by giving firearms, personal equipment, getting the military to assist with the training of uh, ammunition, firearms, equipment, in a logistical manner, provide a, uh, provide a logistical backup. It's easy. It's one decision. It's one signature of the pen, and it can be done. So it's a very close link, and both those objectives got to be achieved. You can't win a war with a security objective that you achieve. You kill all the poachers, but the demand is still there. You've got to sort out both these objectives. The political and the security objective has to be achieved to say we have won this war. Normally a lengthy prison sentence of up to 40 years will deter people from wrongdoing, but not the rhino poacher. Our problem is here that we have got the vast majority of our indigenous people are poor. So you offer him his ex-army and he can use a gun. You offer him thousands of rands to go and kill a rhino. He's going to be very tempted no matter what the, uh, the, the sentence will be if he's caught because he does not picture himself being caught. For every one poacher that you get off the street, there are 10 others who are willing to take their place because at the moment the risk and reward ratio is very high. They're willing to take that risk because the potential reward if they do succeed is so high. You are dealing here with syndicates who operate outside of South Africa, who although might have operatives in South Africa. Now, for, for us to effectively deal with this challenge, we need to find ways of collaborating actively in terms of firstly information sharing with those countries, secondly and in areas of enforcement, and uh, thirdly in the area of creating awareness in those countries too, to, to ensure that as and when people buy the horn in the black market, they get a sense and they know of the fact that the, the horn was taken from a runner that was killed in South Africa. I think they are all three here. I don't know what they are, do, what they are using the horns for, but what I think they are using for some medicine, what, they, what is good for them, or they are used for the trucks or whatsoever, I don't know, but I don't think it's cool for that, you see, because those rhinos too, they want to live, you see. Even our children, they want to, we want them when they grow up, they, go, they have to see them, they have to know them, you see. Cultural and medicinal myths about rhino horns date back thousands of years in countries like Vietnam, Thailand and China. These countries feed the demand for rhino horns. But does the average citizen in China, for example, know the brutal nature of rhino massacre in Africa?
，对于有些人来说，他肯定还是会的，但大部分人来说是不会的，就是因为他们对犀牛的这个这个见过的很少，知识也很少，可能就是说专门的去找这个，可能也是不大可能。嗯。I've been in, in China, uh, in fact in Beijing, twice in the last year, spoken to a university professor who has said that uh, in China it's actually illegal. It doesn't seem to stop it. Uh, trade is rife. You look at the, the, the people on the streets, live scorpions dipped into, into hot uh, cooking oil, starfish still moving on their little skewers, and parents giving them to their kids as a novelty. Um, in my view, Changing the mindset of the Asian markets where you're looking at thousands of years of traditional medicine is not going to just quickly go away. And in fact, we don't know how many people are using rhino horn. It does appear that it's in fact more the affluent communities that can afford it, given the current price on, on the black market. The big problem that you face in terms of education is you are battling a 5,000 year old belief and you're not going to eradicate that overnight. Not even with research studies, not with, with proven Western medicines, but through education, probably, we could eradicate the demand altogether, but that's going to take time. If we had to educate the entire population of China and Korea and Vietnam that horns contain no medicinal value, they're not really meant to be status products. Uh, ornamentally, they, they don't have the, the, the appeal that, that ivory, for argument's sake, has. Um, we could probably drive the message home, but our rhinos don't have that much time. They don't have 20 or 30 or 40 years for us to get the message across. I spoke with Jackie Chan when I was in China. I mean, he's a real icon. One man, could he perhaps change things? Because uh, maybe the Chinese would listen to someone like Jackie Chan. I don't mean to sound negative, but I doubt it. Because, candidly, if just 1%, in fact less than 1% of the Asian peoples wanted to use rhino horn for medicinal reasons or whatever reason, the rhino's plight would just be exacerbated and quite candidly we're now at the tipping point. There are three billion people, very nearly half the world's population, we, which are exposed to the use of rhino horn for various things. While it's very difficult to change ancient cultural beliefs, spreading awareness in Asian countries about the barbaric killing of thousands of rhinos runs into obstacles such as media freedom. Most social platforms and sites like YouTube are blocked in mainland China. Press freedom or not, some non-profit organizations continue to make Asians aware of the rhino's desperate plight. Wild Aid's message of once the buying stops, the killing will too, has been carried by movie star Jackie Chan and Yao Ming, a world-famous basketball player. Maybe the rhino campaigning will achieve similar success as the crusade to stop using shark fins and soup. Removing a rhino's horn is an anti-poaching proposition of some conservationists. The idea of dehorning a rhino has its opponents. They believe that this procedure will have a negative influence on the animal's behavior. There is no reason at all why the rhino's horn growth should change. If you cut it too short and you hit the quick, then obviously you've damaged the growth point of the horn. So you must not cut it too short. And obviously as the rhino grows older, it will grow slower. But there is no uh, difference in growth, apart from the fact, of course, that the rhino grinds its horn. So after three or four years, it'll have a sharp horn. So uh, you first get the permits. Um, and then if you have all the permits and authorities are informed, you can uh, dart the rhino, you prepare a dart. We use atorphin, that's a very strong morphine, around 10,000 times. Uh, one drop is deadly for humans, so that's why we have to be very careful working with these drugs. And then we, we dart the animal. This little one, eh? The middle one. Okay. I'll shoot the shoulder. That's the wind. That's fine. Um, once the animal is down, we take DNA samples, blood, hair, skin and nail. 
and also some shaving of the horn. We have to uh, do that uh, by regulation of the authorities. So every rhino I dart gets DNA samples taken. We check the chip number. Every rhino has a, a unique number. And that number will relate with the chip number in the, in the horn to make sure that the horn is always tracked back to the rhino it's coming from. That's very important. Okay, so we got blood for DNA analysis. Every rhino gets blood taken. Um, we put notches in to identify every rhino. Every rhino has a unique number so that we can manage them and check them every day. The dart wound is treated. We check the chip number of the animal. We, we measure the, stop, the, the horn and then we take off the, the horn. The question to be asked, if you were a rhino, is whether you would rather be without a horn or dead. Yeah, you know, I often get these questions if it's ethical to dehorn a rhino. For me, as a veterinarian, it's important that it's not an amputation. It's a temporary solution, which means all the rhinos that are dehorned today all have their horn back in three, four years. So we can change the procedure every time, the policy, whether you want to dehorn or not. These days, poaching is so bad that if I was a rhino, I would prefer to have no horn these days. And it's sad, nobody likes it, but that's just the situation how it is. And if it would be a permanent amputation, I wouldn't do it, because you can never do that to a wild animal. It's keratin, and um, we don't go in the live tissue. So it's exactly the same as cutting your hair, uh, uh, clipping your nail. We go quite wide over the germinal layer, wide enough to not damage it, you see? So this will grow back completely normal. So it's com completely the same as that you go to the hair cutter every year. I think we must get a waker up, yeah? So to me, it's an entire win-win situation. Win for the rhino, win for us. It may not stop him being poached, but it has to inhibit the poaching to a certain extent. The fact that the poacher is going to the same amount of work, the same risk for a quarter of the return. But the rhinos themselves are not damaged in any way whatsoever. In general, what we found is that rhino cows that don't have horns tend to not fall pregnant as often because it's almost as though the body knows that she wouldn't be able to protect her young. Um, the pecking order in terms of, of rhino social structures is d dramatically changed when, for example, a dominant bull loses his horn because now suddenly this bull can be intimidated and bullied by a six-month-old or a year-old calf who really shouldn't be at the top of the pecking order but because they have a horn, they are. So, you know, rhinos use their horns for, for, for very many things. They use it to lead and nurture their young. They use it to forage. Um, it, it, it certainly serves a purpose, otherwise they would have been born without it. And it's just sad. I don't think there's any, anything sadder than a rhino with a little stump when, they, when they're supposed to have a magnificent horn. And what makes it even more sad is that even dehorned rhinos get poached because unfortunately the myth is that the most medicinal value lies in the, the base of the horn. And that's why they're hacked out of the face and, and not just cut off on the, on the surface. Few sights in the wild create such a stir amongst tourists as a massive rhino with an impressive horn. Besides running a wildlife park, Lorinda Herden is also the founder of the Rhino Rescue Project. This project has developed its own countermeasure against rhino poaching by spreading the word that they treat their horns with an ectoparasite harmful to humans, Lorinda argues the consumers will think twice before they buy or use the horn. This procedure is 
very much still in its in its infancy. It's it's an experimental procedure and something that we had hoped we wouldn't have to roll out as quickly as we did. However, we were our hand was forced and and we had to implement the, this this program within two years. So we treated the rhinos on this reserve about two years ago and have monitored them since to see whether their behavior was adversely affected, whether their health was adversely affected, and, uh, and found that it was, was 100%. It's largely centered around an indelible dye. So the indelible dye means it's a dye that cannot be, that's indestructible. It can't be, can't be removed from the horn in any way. So it's the same kind of dye that's used in the banking industry. It's a compound that is registered for use on animals, so it's 100% safe for the rhino. That was our primary concern, that there be no side effects for the rhino and as little collateral damage as possible around the animal. So it's oxpecker friendly and vulture safe as well. Um, but obviously it is inadvisable for humans to consume. I see that as a, as a very good solution for smaller game parks, smaller game reserves, where it's an ecotourism park, they're never going to dehorn because the people, the tourist wants to come and see the big five, not the big four and a half, so to speak. So that is a good solution in the short term. The unfortunate thing, as we know, is that rhino horn is going to grow out once that ectoparasiticide will grow out within about four to five years. So the animal has to be retreated and retreated and so on. And it lived for about 40 years. That's an expensive exercise, but a very good solution for the private game owner that wants to protect these animals and not dehorn them. Rescue Rhino Project has treated about 200 rhinos since 2011. With none of these animals having been poached to date, the demand and popularity of this deterrent is increasing. The lobbying for the legalization of trade in rhino horns is also gaining momentum. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES, banned the international trade in rhino horns in 1977 as a measure to stop the slaughtering of rhinos. Proponents of the legal trade in rhino horns, however, argue that since 1977, more than 100,000 rhinos have been poached. By making it illegal, it only fueled the illegal trade, they say. Currently, the people who demand the horn, and you know there's plenty, they either have to kill the rhino legally, in a manner that I've just explained to you, or they deal with the poachers illegally. But the government of South Africa is said to have 21 tons in stock. The private sector certainly has a few tons in stock. My feeling is if we release that and we even try to make a deal with them or try and influence them in saying we will grow you rhino horn. We will grow it, not in the national parks but on private farms. We will grow you. We, here we are. We are able to supply you with a few ton of rhino horn. Please stop killing our rhinos because the rhino horn is going to come to you anyway. I believe that would have an effect and they would deal less with the poachers because in other words they would have a source from a different point where we are not killing the rhinos. Whereas at the moment the only source they have is from dead rhinos. The South American vacuna is related to the llama. The vicuna with its sought-after ultra-fine fleece used in the fashion industry suffered the same fate as the rhino. The animal almost became extinct. What happened was a fashion designer and a group of conservationists got together um, after some time um, and formulated a plan where they involved the communities, uh, started distributing vicuna two areas, taught the communities how to look after them, reintroduced a situation called the chaku, which is where basically communities, it was a traditional roundup of vicuña, they then got sheared and the vicuña were then released again. This happened approximately every two years um, and slowly the poaching numbers reduced, vicuña numbers shot up and over a period of about 30 years the population of Vicuna recovered very, very healthily. The communities were benefiting from the situation. The fashion designers were getting their products and all in all, you had a very good situation. Much like the rhino, the Vicuna's product is sustainable yeah. and it can be harvested without harming the animal. Obviously, you know, there are dissimilarities and certain other things to be thought of in the situation. But on the whole, we feel that it's absolutely insane that our rhinos are dying for a product that can be harvested from them without harming them and for something that can be farmed and 
handed out to the consumers? I am all for legalizing trade in rhino horn. Legalizing but, as said, controlling that trade. How can people say it won't work if it's never been tried? And you cannot, as so many people do, compare it to, to when they legalize the trade in ivory. That animal has to be killed. The rhino does not have to be killed. That horn can be harvested 12 to 15 times in the animal's lifetime. I believe that we have never got the indigenous population of Africa on the rhino side. Rhinos have been persecuted and poached by th in their thousands, probably 60,000 from 1960 until now. But my feeling is that at no time during that 60 years did we get the indigenous population on the side of the rhinos. We could do that in South Africa. We could take 400 rhinos a year from the Kruger National and other national parks. We could either donate them or have them donated by overseas donors to our indigenous population in this country. We could teach those communities to farm with rhinos and sustainably reap the horn in order to get an income from it. But obviously, in order to do that, you need the CITES regulations changed to be able to trade in rhino horn. For that, we need the government's help and the world's help, in fact. I believe that CITES needs to seriously, and I know it's a complex issue, but CITES seriously needs to look at the viability of not just legalizing trade, I believe that could be potentially dangerous, legalizing and controlling trade to the Asian markets. If South Africa, for instance, wakes up tomorrow and decides that we're going to open trade in rhino horn, who's going to buy your horns? Because internationally, there's no country that's going to buy your horns. So it requires a bigger engagement. It requires an international engagement because the trade is not just only in rhino horn in South Africa. It's a global ban on trade. We don't particularly want to go out and sell rhino horn. That was never ever our intention. But the circumstances of where we are, it's the same as going back to the Wright brothers. When they first spoke about flight, they were criticized, they were laughed at, and, and, and it was idiotic. But it was tried and was turned to be a successful industry. We are at exactly that same tipping point. We can either try and through a process of education, trying to collapse demand, as well as supplying limited quantity. And the revenue will come straight back to conservation. We can try it. If it does not work, you can always shut it down. But at this moment in time, we are talking, as we have been doing for 24 years now, and the net result is we are talking about tens of thousands of carcasses dotted over Africa. So how much more must we talk? The next Convention on Trade and Endangered Species is due in 2016. This will be a decisive event for those in favor of legalized rhino horn trading. The government of South Africa has issued a statement that it will be exploring the option of legalizing horn trade. A research team has been commissioned that will present this case at CITES in 2016. I don't think we can stop this rhino poaching if we don't stand together, you see. Because we have to report these people. We can't let these people do this thing because it's wrong for the rhinos to do so to them. A rhino is not a bad thing or it's not a, a bad animal or to people, towards people, because I don't see the reason why people have to do poaching or killing rhinos. It's not good. Because it's something belong to to the world, you see. Just like a person who belong to this world. A rhino is just like that. Rhino poaching is an issue that impacts on all South Africans, although some feel that there are bigger problems facing our country. You know, rhinos belong to everyone, especially the rhinos in national parks, because National parks are meant for the nation as a whole. So it's not just my problem because I'm a rhino owner. It should be your problem because in effect you 
have a sense of ownership over these animals. They're one of the most iconic animals in South Africa. They are one of the reasons why this is such a unique tourist destination. And it's something that, that we should have a sense of national pride over. For me, it's not specifically just about the rhino. I mean, the wild dogs are a huge case in point. But the rhino is iconic. And it's a symbol for me of two words, greed and ignorance. And if we can deal with those two issues, the rhino becomes a symbol of a, toward a solution. While the killing of rhinos in South Africa and other parts of the continent continues almost unabatedly, the rhino fraternity in the Republic struggles to speak with one voice when it comes to finding solutions. All parties agree that poaching must be stopped in its tracks. There is consensus amongst them that now is the time to find common ground and that every South African must join the fight against these ruthless killers who have no respect for life and limb. The plight of the rhino is much more serious than most people think. If something drastic is not done now, future generations will wonder why their ancestors were so careless as to let this magnificent animal disappear from the face of the earth. Globally, as a people, we would have to hang our heads in shame for we would have failed uh, the world, our children, our children's children, we would have failed to, to conserve the rhino and it would, have been, it would have just gone extinct on our watch. We can turn it around. It is possible, but it's going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people. Extraordinary effort from everybody, everybody. Private sector, parks, national parks, everybody that is involved with rhino protection. We need to actually start uniting. Get egos out of the way. Those well-intentioned ideas are pretty much like a drop of water in the desert. Pulling together, uniting toward a common cause and accepting and understanding that perhaps there are more than just one solution, which I certainly believe. Then we unite to save the rhinos. For me, a bigger purpose or greater purpose is achieved. Using, saving that iconic species and uniting different mindsets to come together to save that species is a very powerful step to future conservation endeavours. We do feel that um, fragmentation and division amongst all the rhino groups and the stakeholders is extremely detrimental. It's obviously a very sentimental, very emotional issue um, and we all feel emotional about it. Um, we don't necessarily want everybody to remove all emotion from it because then our rhinos will definitely go extinct if no one cares. But what people need to do is they need to start understanding that there's a bigger concept here. They need to start understanding the true principles of conservation. So maybe we need to meet somewhere in the middle and I think that's the there's probably no other industry that is as fragmented as this one and where people are so unwilling to to meet each, each other halfway. And because we're being that stubborn, we are allowing these animals to be killed wholesale.